let us worship God. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Let's stand. good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for all your goodnesses to us. We acknowledge that every good thing we have comes from your hand. We thank you uh, that you've given our lives a, a meaning and a purpose that transcends our daily lives. Help us to be patient with the frustrations that we experience and help us to focus our energies on our faithfulness to you. May our faithfulness in some way serve you. We acknowledge that we often do fail you. We pray that your spirit would work in our lives. May your spirit work in our consciences to, to constantly remind us to serve you, to obey you, to be faithful to you as uh, our first responsibility. And uh, help us to put our daily uh, responsibilities into proper perspective in terms of our overall service to you and to your kingdom. We thank you that your kingdom is growing. We thank you that there are those uh, uh, around the world that, that worship you and, um, in cultures and languages we, we can't understand. And yet we know they're part of your kingdom. We, we acknowledge that your kingdom is growing and it will continue to grow. And we pray that you would uh, make us part of that growing process we pray for the West and we pray for its revival. We um, long to see our culture and our community so consciously uh, committed to doing what is right because uh, uh, of their obedience to you in faith. We ask now that you would accept our words of praise and we pray that the words that are spoken here would be faithful to your word. In Jesus, our Savior's name. Our opening hymn is hymn number 455, 455. 
responsive reading this morning is Psalter Selection 75 from Psalm 147. Psalter Selection 75 from Psalm 47, 147. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. Lord God, build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He appointed the number of the stars. He called them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise unto the harp, upon the harp unto our God. Who covereth the heavens with the clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Praise, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath strengthened the bars of the gate of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace to thy borders, and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool, he scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels, who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melted them, he causeth his wind to blow and the waters to blow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Let's now join in uh, reciting in unison the Ten Commandments at the front of our soldier booklets. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Hear also the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our first scripture this morning is Luke 24, beginning at verse 33, continuing through verse 48. Luke 24, beginning at verse 33. Our subject this morning is repentance and forgiveness. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and, and of honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooveth Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things." Our lesson today is on the first post-resurrection appearances of Christ to the disciples. He has already appeared at the tomb to Mary Magdalene, and very shortly thereafter he appeared to the other women as they probably returned from the tomb separately from Mary. Then we see that afternoon he had appeared to uh, two men on the road to Emmaus, one of whose name was uh, Cleopas, and we're not told who the other one was. Verse 34 is a very uh, brief reference to an appearance to Peter, which is interesting. Earlier, when they were speaking to Jesus and recounting the events of the day, the two men had not mentioned the appearance to Peter. Only that John and Peter had confirmed the empty tomb. When they went back to Jerusalem that very evening, they referred to his appearance to Simon. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 also has a reference to an appearance to um, Simon Peter. There he's referred to uh, as Cephas. So that's, we only have two very passing references to something without any uh, description of the actual appearance. And uh, the, uh, this, is, this is a bit odd. And this brings up something we should note. They say, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that he appeared to Peter before he appeared to the twelve. Well, we see a couple phrases here that appear to be contradictory or inaccurate. Mark 16, 14 refers to Jesus appearing to the eleven. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 says he appeared to the twelve. But we're specifically told in John 20, 24 that Thomas was not with them. So the math doesn't seem to work at all. <clears throat> 
12 disciples minus Judas minus Thomas is 10. So neither the terms 11 or 12 appear to be precisely correct. And the reason for such language is that the disciples represented a group. And so they were referred to as a collective noun. The 12 were a body. In referring to the 12, the reference was to the group, not necessarily to the number of the disciples present at any given time. Now, because of the apostasy of Judas, you can see why the reference to the group would be self-consciously changed from the 12 to the 11, because they self-consciously now were <coughs> excluding Judas. Not only was he not physically present, but he was apostate. So when referring to them as the 11 or the 12, we're not seeing a reference to the number present, but to the group. We have another example where a number doesn't necessarily represent that number, and that was the 12 tribes. There were not 12 tribes, there were 13 tribes. Joseph was one of the 12 brothers, but each of his two sons received an inheritance. There's no tribe of Joseph, because the rest of his life was to be in, in Egypt. But as a reward for what he had done in saving his people, saving his family, uh, Jacob gave an equal shares of inheritance to both of his sons. So Ephraim and Manasseh were both tribes of Israel. But we never refer to the 13 tribes of Israel. So, the two from Emmaus knew that at some point Jesus had appeared to Peter, but we have no details of that appearance to Peter. In verse 36, we see that they were describing their own experience at Emmaus when Jesus appeared. Since there, that he had already appeared to Peter, Part of their explanation probably involved Peter's account as well. Incidentally, verse 33 clearly says that there were other disciples present besides <laughs> the, the 12 or the 10. Also of interest is that Mark only mentions one thing about this appearance of Jesus. One thing only. And that was the reprimand that Jesus gave at this time when he appeared to them. In Mark 16, 14, he said, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, upbraided is a strong word. The way we normally see that word that's the Greek word used in the New Testament, uh, is the criticism and the attacks on Jesus by unbelievers, or the attacks on Christians by unbelievers. It's an, it means an intentionally strong scolding or reprimand. Jesus is reprimanding the disciples. Why? Because they had dismissed the testimony of the women who said they saw him. They assumed the women could not distinguish between a real life appearance and a vision. It's not by accident. These women are some of those who had financed the ministry of Jesus. It's no accident he appeared to them first. They, were, they are not the celebrities of the New Testament. They're often just mentioned as being present, but we are told specifically that Mary Magdalene and Joanna, at least, are specifically stated as helping to finance the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. 
But the women were dismissed as too emotional to be tr trusted. They were seeing things, and they were dismissed. So in verses 36 and 37, Jesus turns the tables on the disciples. He makes them doubt their own senses. He appeared to them, and they were terrified. They had accused the women of seeing a vision and not understanding it was a vision. Now they think they're seeing a vision, and they're frightened. Now, what had been the reaction of Mary Magdalene when she saw Jesus at the tomb? She wanted to cling to him. What had been the reaction of the other women when they saw Jesus? We're told they fell down and held him by the feet. And the disciples, when they heard that, said, these poor women, they're seeing things. But we know better. So when Jesus appears to the disciples, what is their reaction? They were terrified. They were affrighted and thought they were seeing a spirit. Incidentally, it's not a Christian idea that says women are basically emotional creatures and men are rational creatures. That was actually a product of the Enlightenment, which came after the Reformation, the Enlightenment put a heavy emphasis on reason. And the Enlightenment thinkers, men I'm sure, gave men an extra measure of rationality and said that women were largely controlled by their emotions. Of course, that was a very self-serving assumption which justified letting men make all the decisions. In fact, it was so bad that many laws were passed, often blamed on Christianity, that said women could not inherit property, that it had to go directly to their sons or to another male heir in the family. Or if a woman owned property, it immediately, she, she could not control it if she remarried. And there's a lot of injustices that occurred because Men married women for their property and then disposed of it to their advantage and to the disadvantage of the woman and her children by their previous marriage. So women were actually slowly over a period of time legislated into a position of inferiority. Why? Because they weren't rational enough to be making decisions and men had to make them for it. That's an enlightenment view. It's not a biblical view. So Jesus reprimanded them, first of all, for their unbelief, but also for their hardness of heart, their lack of perception because they hadn't believed the witnesses, which at this point includes the two men from Emmaus and Peter as well. Jesus had referred to the two at Emmaus as fools and slow of heart to believe. But that criticism was directed at their lack of understanding of the scriptures. Because regardless of how close they were to the, you know, Jesus and the Twelve, they had grown up in the synagogues, they had heard the scriptures, and they still didn't understand them. So that was really the reference of Jesus to, the, to those two men, that they should have understood that this was all coming from the scriptures. Now when he condemned those two men, they were using the same criteria as all Jews did. So Jesus is basically saying, you Jews have it all there in the scriptures. You've been read the scriptures over and over and over again, and you still don't understand the true nature of atonement. Now he's specifically upbraiding the disciples and those with them for not believing the witnesses. It's interesting that in verse 48, Jesus notes, ye are witnesses of these things. Now they were witnesses. Now they had seen with their own eyes. Jesus told them that they were now witnesses specifically in the context of what was to come, and that was the preaching of repentance and remission of sins. Now those who had not believed the earlier witnesses were themselves witnesses who were called to go preach this to others. 
So they would at least understand the reluctance to believe because they had been reluctant to believe the reality of the resurrection because they were taking it in a vacuum. They did not yet understand the necessity of the crucifixion and the resurrection. They hadn't associated it with remission of sins. They hadn't associated it with the atonement. We took, mentioned this last week that to a Jew, if you talked about forgiveness, it says, yes, that's forgiveness that comes through atonement, and we have a process for that. It happens in the temple, and you offer sacrifice. God accepts that as atonement for sins. If they didn't see that as a type of something to come, and they did not have the concept of the Messiah being the Lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. They thought the Messiah was going to usher in a golden age. So they believed in a Messiah that was going to save them, but they didn't have the concept of what salvation was really like. So it's, in the Old Testament, did they understand sin and the need for atonement? Absolutely. And they were faithful to that to a certain extent, and they kept that understanding. But Jesus now opens them up and says, in effect, he was saying, I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the one who actually takes away. Now you're going to pe preach repentance and remission of sins, which is forgiveness of sins. So Jesus showed them the physical reality of his resurrection. To dispel any notion that his return was not physical, he first of all showed them his hands and his feet. Now the wounds were only a few days old. Remember, this is Sunday evening. This is the, he had just that morning the tomb had been discovered to be empty, and this is that evening. And it was only after they saw the wounds that the disciples believed that this was a physical resurrection of Jesus after he was dead. In addition, Luke notes that Jesus asked for food. Jesus was alive. As a human, he physically needed food. And so he ate as they watch. Jesus had referred to his death and resurrection several times. Now in verses 44 through 47, Jesus explains how his death was necessary to fulfill the words of Scripture. He says his death would form the basis for the coming preaching of repentance, and remission of sins. Repentance was nothing new. John the Baptist had preached repentance. But remission of sins was now something they did, hadn't really fully understood. They'd only understood a shadow of it, the right which represented for <coughs> remission of sins. Remission of sins means uh, that an exemption, it's an exemption from the penalty of something it's closely related to forgiveness. But, but Jesus said, this is what you're now going to preach. What you had a hard time believing, you have to understand as related to the remission of sins. It's through my blood. It's through my sacrifice. Simply stated, Jesus was telling the disciples that everything in the scriptures pointed to his death and resurrection. And because of his death and resurrection, they were now going to be preaching repentance and forgiveness in a very new light. Now let's turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John 20. We're going to read nine, verses 19 through 29. John 20, 19 through 29. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. 
As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto them, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands and the print of his nails, and put my finger into this print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The mission of the disciples as apostles was to convey the accomplished work of Jesus. Because they were witnesses, Jesus was going to send them. The two words we see in verse 21 as sent and send are different. The Father sent Jesus and Jesus sends the disciples. They're actually two words. Jesus was sent by the Father. That's the word we have for apostle and also apostate, because an apostate is someone who is sent and accepts um, an assignment, but then turns away from that assignment. Jesus was sent by the Father with a mission, and only Jesus had that ultimate mission. Jesus uses that different word when he says, I'm sending you. That has a more general reference to sending. The commission is the mission of Jesus Christ, and only he suffered and died and atoned for our sins. He, in turn, sends the disciples in terms of a larger commission, one under his authority. See, our authority is subordinate to that of Jesus Christ. There was a, a heresy that developed in the, the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church said they were the continuing incarnation of Jesus. We do not have the same mission or purpose as Jesus. We have a subordinate calling, a subordinate mission in terms of his higher authority. Jesus was sent with overall authority. Under Jesus, disciples are sent not with an independent authority, but with an assigned duty. Luke described that as the preaching of repentance and remission, or forgiveness of sins. See, disciples have no inherent authority. Disciples preach the mission of Jesus Christ. That's why the disciples had to understand that it was a literal resurrection of Jesus. They all doubted, and Jesus had to convince them that it was a real physical resurrection. We use the term minister. We use the same word minister as a root word of administer. See, an administer does not have independent authority. He has a duty to do certain things. He administers certain responsibilities. Ministers are the same way. They don't have independent authority. They get their authority from Jesus Christ and the Word, and they minister that. But it's a job. It's a subordinate to a, another authority, both to Christ and the Word. See, ministers and disciples do not legislate. They don't uh, speak with their own authority. So the authority of the church is not in question. What's really here, given here, is the responsibility 
of the church to do the work that Jesus has assigned them in his authority. Jesus then said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. There's been a, that's puzzled people for a long time because we're specifically told in Acts that the Holy Spirit was given uh, weeks later. But I think part of the problem there is that that what Jesus said there is viewed separately from the next uh, admonition, which is in verse 23. After he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, verse 23 says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. <coughs> True spirituality refers to the power of God's Spirit. Their commissioning was not just a permission, but a blessing to proceed in the power of the Spirit of God. They had a higher calling, and that calling was of God. Their preaching would be in terms of Christ's work and how it must relate to their new understanding of repentance and forgiveness. There's no forgiveness without repentance. And that's something that's not very popular in the church. In fact, some of the most popular preachers today who believe in this idea of positive thinking, by whatever name they want to call it, they think, well, if you talk about sin, if you talk about uh, repentance that turns people away and we want to bring them in to hear the good news. So we'll just teach a positive message but there's no forgiveness unless there's repentance. You cannot be forgiven for sins unless you admit you're a sinner. You see? So you can't have the forgiveness without the repentance. Some would question the calling of the disciples some were going to try to co-opt Christianity, just as they're still trying to co-opt Christianity and take it over. In many groups of, of, within Christianity, denominations, organizations that were once Christian have been thoroughly taken over and assumed. But the disciples were given the true relationship of sin and forgiveness, and they were commissioned to go out and preach that relationship of repentance and forgiveness in light of what they now understood about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus, by his commissioning from the Father, was delegating an authority to the disciples. He says, you need to stand fast on these, the teaching about repentance and remission of sins because it was no longer through a temple rite. You can't cling to the shadow when you have the real thing. Now, it was imperative for the disciples, the new 12, the new fathers of the new Israel, to say this is the teaching of the faith when it comes to atonement. We have the perfect, we don't have the shadow, we have the true atonement for sins. And they were going to have to go out and preach this. See, and this authority was ministerial. It was given by Jesus. It says, this is, you have to preach my resurrection. Now that you believe it's true, you have to preach this because this has to do with remission of sins. You have to teach forgiveness, which is culpability for your sins. And, or you have to teach the forgiveness, that all men are either culpable for the punishment for their sins or they're forgiven for their sins based upon their response to my resurrection. Well, the disciples had a positive response to the resurrection. Now, once they realized it was true, we're told there was great joy. Well, a week later, the disciples were again assembled. It says eight days, that's from the resurrection because that evening was really the next day. That was really day two. A week later, Again, Sunday evening, what we would call Sunday evening or Sunday night, they were gathered together. Thomas hadn't been present the previous week for whatever reason, we're not told. Now, Thomas has been given this label as a doubter. 
But he was not the only doubter. They had all doubted. That's why Jesus had reprimanded them. They had doubted. And they didn't believe until Jesus showed himself to them. Thomas expressed the exact same doubt as the other ten um, before uh, the other eleven um, of the eleven before Jesus showed them his wounds. Thomas said, it cannot be real. It cannot be a real physical resurrection. Whatever you saw, it, Jesus died, and it can't be Jesus. So Thomas's suggestion that he had to touch the wounds of Jesus was precipitated in all likelihood by the other disciples' insistence that they saw the wounds. Thomas said, well, I, I, I not only need to see them, I need to touch them if I, to believe you guys. We don't know why, but Jesus had apparently not appeared in the meantime. That fact would have reinforced the original view that it was only a vision or a spirit being that had been seen by all the witnesses. Thomas said, I want to touch before I believe. I want to make sure it's physical. So Christ caused him to regret his lack of belief, just as he had caused the others to regret it by reprimanding them. See, Thomas didn't doubt any more than the others. It's just that it took a week longer for Jesus to force him to believe by showing him the reality. Well, one of the great blessings we then have is in verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. It's been called the last beatitude. Like the others, Thomas now believed in a literal, physical resurrection of Jesus. And so must we. Moreover, when Jesus ascended into heaven... A few weeks later, he did so in his resurrected body. It was a physical, bodily ascension, not one of a spirit. Mm -hmm. Moreover, he said he would come again as they saw him go. Again, he left physically. He will come again in flesh and blood. Jesus will return in the flesh in his resurrection body. Moreover, we're told that when Jesus returns, all the dead will also rise and will have the great judgment. Separation from our bodies is something we take for granted. That's part of the curse, though. Why do we die? It's part of the curse. But if you take what God intended, his created intent, it was it's not natural for us to be separated from our bodies. The, the separation from our bodies that occurs at death is unnatural. It's a result of the curse. But the forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins, the removal of the penalty means that penalty will not remain on those who believe in Jesus because Jesus assumed it. That's why Jesus' resurrection is referred to as the first fruits. It's the first fruit of the harvest of the eventual resurrection of all believers. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that death was the last enemy that would be destroyed. Jesus is now in his resurrected body. And in the resurrection the end of history, we will join him in our resurrection bodies because our death will be undone. That's the meaning of the resurrection and the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the enormity of what we have because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot even comprehend eternal life. 
the, the curse is so much upon us that all we can think of is the inevitability of, of aging and death. We thank you that you have promised to undo even our death oh, no. and that you are not finished with us when we are laid in the ground, but that we will one day live with you in physical bodies throughout all eternity and serve you eternally. Thank you for your um, goodnesses to us. We, we pray that you'd help us not to be uh, consumed by our day-to-day -day cares, but help us to keep all of our day-to-day <coughs> problems and responsibilities in perspective as just our assigned responsibilities. Help us to think rather that, that we have been assigned a duty as your disciples to, to carry on and to live in terms of the reality of the the uh, sal salvation in terms of our Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you for your goodnesses to us and thank you that you have given our life um, a meaning and an eternal hope. We ask this in Jesus our Savior's name. Amen. Let's uh, stand uh, for hymn number 32. 32. Him 32. 32. Sing all three verses of Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs> May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
Oh, you look real cute. Like that. Oh, you look real cute. Like that. See, I like that. Like, you remember sleeping. I think my kids are too fast. Yeah, the dentist pulled up. That's kind of weird, isn't it? You heard about her vision teeth. All four out in one day. Yeah, I think I remember that. Yes, I didn't like that. No, I don't remember it once either. I had that done too. It's a little hard for this octogenarian to remember too, but I think. More instead of blue, too, I think. Some might still be there. Oh, yeah. Oh, very nice. like the blue one. I should ask. Dr. Larry, <laughs> 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 Ross, oh, oh, Jay, we yeah, need to yeah. all come in. Right oh, oh.